Welcome to Miss Insel Kang. <laughs> so happy to have you join us. Thank, Thank you for you. making some time here for us on the Curiosity Project. Um, can we start with just a little bit about your background and how it is that you came to serve here at Village Church in Beaverton? Yeah. So, um, of all things, I definitely never intended to work for the church in any kind of formal way. Um, I was attending this church um, after having grown up in primarily Korean church. That was, uh, I mean, beyond Korean church, it was my family's church. My parents, when we moved to the, to, to the state of Oregon when I was, what, uh, five, six years old, we were of a handful of Asian families in general. And so um, growing up in Salem, we started slowly connecting to any other Korean family as they came through. And uh, we created our own home church and then soon um, had enough people where we were able to send out for a Presbyterian pastor to show up. And the church that's in Salem currently is still the church that my mom attends and that was where I grew up really. Um, but it wasn't until college and post that I really went through my own racial identity development, really came to terms with um, trying as best to really connect the idea that I am Korean fully, but I'm also American fully. Um, and that actually is different in my faith identity than my parents. Because the home church I grew up in um, was very much for that first generation recent immigrant experience. So the, the singing and the sermons and the services were all geared towards that life. So for me, when I came back um, after a couple years on the East Coast post-college, I was realizing that I needed a church that was for me versus my family. So I uh, was back in Oregon and was looking for a church like that. I had a really difficult time connecting. Um, I had experienced a multiracial, multi-ethnic church on the East Coast and was trying to figure out if there would be something like that here. Um, stumbled upon village, really. Um, had heard for a while that there was a Korean fellowship, but I assumed then that just meant that there was a whole separate Korean church that attended here, and I just didn't want to attend that church. Um, so I, I walked in one day, uh, and it was just a, a God thing, because there was a, a service that had just been created, and it was for a more kind of contemporary, um, slightly uh, younger crowd that was looking for a, a, a church service that... Um, didn't necessarily adhere to only tradition, and that was the chapel service at the time. Um, we no longer have that service, but a lot of the foundations of that service are now imbued throughout the rest of the village. So fast forward a few years in, I'm talking to my pastor um, about, hey, as village is trying to do this multicultural thing, um, here are some of my opinions, unsolicited. <laughs> Always unsolicited. Um, regarding, hey, my background is in, your cult, in intercultural relations. Um, there are these effects when we say these types of words, or there are these results if we're trying to um, have a goal towards true integration, true um, honoring of difference, et cetera, et cetera. And before I knew it, one day he said, uh, hey, have you ever considered working full time for a church? And my first reaction was sort of a, you know me. Are, what are you? <laughs> What are, you, what are you saying? What are you putting the church through? Um, but now look at us, almost five years later, I am um, Senior Director of Community, Hospitality, and Communications. So again, very church title, you just cover a whole bunch of things. Um, but all that to say, I am in the executive team now and the first female to be in that role. And um, I am just faking it every day. <laughs> I love hearing that honesty because I feel like I'm often faking it every day as well. Oh my gosh. Do you ever just look at your calendar for the day and go, I guess I'm doing that today. Uh, almost, <laughs> almost every day. Almost every day. Uh, but it's always a beautiful surprise. And always. I'm, and I'm always grateful for the fact yes. that if I trust that God has brought me to this place, then he's going to help see me through. Uh, for me, it's just straight up, God, I guess you're doing this and I'm just physically going to be there to witness it. I'm curious about <laughs> that that maybe that maybe that conversation that you had with your parents coming back from the East Coast looking for a church community of your own but recognizing yeah. that the first generation church experience that your parents brought you up in yes may not be the thing that you were looking for was that a difficult conversation and and what would be can you unpack some of those distinctives between kind of like a first generation immigrant focus sure. and and a second or or a, generation focus. Absolutely. For any of your audience who happen to be in that similar life experience, they'll understand right away. Um, 
it's never it's never stated like definitively like hey welcome to our church we are a first gen immigrant church it's just in the way you do things right so um, I guess I'll start with that um, our church growing up it was always um, things like um, you know as simple as even we're celebrating like anniversaries and holidays that have to do with Korea. Um, I am Korean for your for your listeners for your watchers. Um, so it was you know things about making sure we commemorate the end of the Korean War, um, commemorating um, national holidays that had to do with some of the great like um, historical figures of Korea's history. Um, doing things in a tradition that was befitting of kind of acknowledging the hardship of being um, not quite a uh, full-fledged uh, American in the eyes of greater society here. So, um, you know, just the idea that the service itself and all the sort of accoutrements, so the, there's always lunch after service, you know, things like that, were really more not necessarily towards the kind of um, pan-Christian sense of like hospitality or like normal church tradition. It's like it's going to be Korean food. It's going to be celebrating and uh, mourning the loss of uh, community because of the war splitting the country into two. It's going to be, um, you know, uh, reminiscing about, you know, the, the poverty that so many of the first gen experienced, like my mom, um, because it was post-war and the country was rebuilding. Um, it's the fact that, you know, so much of the kids' curriculum had to do with making sure that uh, it's also very cultural, but just making sure that you're thanking your parents all the the time and that you're very grateful to your parents for all that they've done not just as your parents but for the sacrifice of they came here they gave up everything they started brand new for you to have a better life that was those weren't subtle messages those were that's you know we, we say that very just bluntly all the time so then it meant that often um, the sermons not you know let alone the kind of language difference right I grew up in an almost um, Korean King James type religion. So uh, I knew that this wasn't casual Korean, and yet that meant that there was even more of a distance for me when I was listening to the adult sermons, let's say. Um, but then as I got older, and now I'm more in the high school years, et cetera, realizing that um, they're kind of at a loss for how to relate to me um, as far as staff goes, um, and they don't really have programming for me because they're kind of, uh, at least in that kind of small home church model, they were sort of expecting me now to sort of help shoulder some of the responsibilities that the adults were doing. So suddenly I'm thrown into Sunday school and I'm, and I'm just mimicking everything I grew up with. So I'm telling these younger kids who are even now more second, third generation, um, make sure you're grateful, you know, like it's time for Mother's Day, we're going to do the same exercise of writing the, I'm so grateful for all the sacrifices my mom has made essay that gets read aloud in front of everyone, um, ask any Korean James, this is <laughs> so normal. <laughs> Um, so all that to say, uh, frankly, I think in a way I outgrew, um, I don't know, uh, what was being taught for, for younger people. And so then as I'm able to then re receive some of that um, teaching and training from other things, whether it was college ministry groups or, frankly, it was a lot of growth when I moved away and I was living in New York for a while, um, experiencing for the first time, uh, you know, sermons fully in English, lecture style. Um, it's not just sort of berating or, or shaming, um, <laughs> but it was also just very kind of suddenly it was the rise of the academic kind of lecture style sermon and I had never experienced it before. Um, so all that to say when I came back I was able to really uh, define what I was looking for and my mom couldn't deny that those were all very good things. And she also couldn't deny that my home church probably wasn't going to offer that to me um, as a solo person versus a, 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 an extension of the family. So she was very, as kind of the main, I'd say, faith leader of our family, was very just like supportive of go, find, find a church then, um, and suggested Village, actually. So, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. Village is, um, has made a very intentional yes. movement towards... Yeah the integration of multiple cultures and mm -hmm. multiple languages within one unified church expression. Yes. Tell us a little bit about some of the theological underpinnings of why the village has pursued a ministry strategy like this. Yes. Man, um, the 
there are so many, so many uh, uh, passages in the Bible that not only speak to this, but if you're really able to take a step back, you can really see that God's original intention from the very beginning was a diversity in his creation. Um, I think we have forgotten what an impact that has made as far as sin enters the world. Now we're all um, in different kind of uh, groupings, frankly, and we only know that. And so there's so, so much to that kind of human nature of you want to be around people who are like you. But then when you realize how that's also put up barriers for us to learn from one another, to, to experience each other's ways of worship, to expand our own, um, the fact that you represent a whole different level of the image of God than if I were to only look at people who have my face, let's say. Um, <clears throat> all of that was so within my heart, but at Village was just so much more um, kind of... Uh, just out there is, is how we function. So um, historically, um, we, we thank God we have this written down because I will always forget the exact na- dates. But um, Village was originally planted um, as sort of a, a community church to reach out to the neighborhood um, ages ago from a church in Forest Grove, 70 years ago. Actually, this summer will be our 70th anniversary. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was always the mission of Village originally was to make sure we were actually a church to our community. And then about 30 years ago, I believe, um, as the area around Village Beaverton was starting to change, we had a pastor at the time, prophetic, who was able to see that the demographics of our population were changing, but Village's community was not, and found that to be just incongruent with what's happening, and started sort of the plan of we need to at least um, figure out how to actually replicate looking like our neighborhood. This is, we can't not look like our neighborhood, and it's changing. We need a change too. Um, then fast forward to God placing um, uh, within village a couple Korean families who just showed up one day. It wasn't like we went out and invited them. And uh, very organically, they were meeting um, after the service to kind of make sure that they were amongst each other, that they had really understood the sermon. So they're, they're meeting with each other, doing this in Korean, you know, having lunch, that kind of thing. And at the time, Pastor uh, PJ, uh, Pastor Jensen, uh, started meeting with them and started hearing what their needs were, started really understanding kind of what um, their experience was like here at Village. And that from there slowly grew our Korean fellowship. So that was like the first kind of ethnic um, fellowship that started attending Village and really teaching us, frankly, okay, we want to be in this church too, and we want to make sure we're all integrated as a church body, but how do we support this group then? So that's when it started with, well, we need a pastor for them so that they can make sure that they're receiving all the spiritual teaching and nourishment and and worship in their own heart language at times too, but also so that they can speak on behalf of their needs, et cetera, et cetera. So now fast forward, we've got a Hispanic fellowship, we have a Chinese fellowship, we have an Asian American fellowship, because that's actually um, more into the second and beyond generation, because that's also different than first generations. Um, We have... um, Hispanic Fellowship, which is our kind of second largest group. Uh, we have a growing Indian Fellowship. But again, by able by being able to call them a fellowship, we're recognizing, hey, you have critical mass. You are, you are here. Um, we need to be paying attention to your cultural needs. We need to be paying attention to what you are bringing to our community and how amazing that is. But then at the same time, then the responsibility is on our leadership and our church structure to really show people How do we keep striving for this really difficult um, balance of we're not just asking everyone who is a ethnic minority or let's say uh, non-dominant culture to just assimilate to the way we do church, but instead you are adding to how, um, frankly, our fabric is is created, what it looks like, what it sounds like. Um, And it's not perfect. It is a constant um, process that is, is, you know, being... um, adjusted and worked on, but um, I would highly recommend if, if any of your uh, followers can, um, Pastor Paul Choi, he is our resident genius. He did the most fantastic sermon called Christ the Conductor a few months back. Um, and it just he just goes through so many Bible passages. He goes through so much of this history of village in particular. Um, and he also has sort of a message to both the immigrant or the new person having moved into the 
to this country, let's say, or the neighborhood, as well as then to the host people of what their responsibility is as well. And it's just this sort of amazing kind of negotiation of the experience together that we can learn from one another, we can um, take from one another just the richness of how we know God, but that um, we're, we're striving to figure out what this body of Christ looks like, where we're not necessarily the ones telling you, whoever you might be, how to do it, but we're actually informing each other. So mm-hmm. it's not, um, it's definitely not the most straightforward way to do church, in the least. Um, but I now can't imagine not being in a church like this now that I've experienced this now that you've given me a taste of this it's like okay how do we how do we get um, more of this yeah and unpack that a little bit more for us so yeah. can you give us an example or some sort of anecdote that kind of reflects kind of the beauty the thing that we celebrate when you've got multiple cultures yeah. interacting in this way you know um, n- nothing to diminish the value of it but you could you could simply start by saying oh man you know the food at the potlucks is <laughs> fantastic right like it seems so cheesy but that's definitely a benefit um but the other end is um frankly from a a mindset sometimes that gets um just unintentionally kind of centered around a a more western sense of faith to remember things like oh um we have we have uh, uh members who are of indian descent who have been christian for generations uh, and forgetting that Christianity existed in India or um, the realities of, of talking to someone when they're saying, um, hey, they, we have a recent group now that's moved up from Venezuela. Um, uh, Christian from, from back home too, uh, but their needs now, because they're coming out of this very current crisis, um, have changed the way we're talking about certain things. Uh, it's it's real time for them when we're talking about you know um, the poor, the hungry, the the marginalized. Um, it's it's the beauty of seeing how our seniors interact. You know, in in Asian culture, there's there's a lot of deference for hierarchy. So to kind of even see sometimes like our Asian kids like automatically do that for our white seniors too, or um, see how my Latino members um, are very concerned about whether or not I'm going to meet their son soon or not. <laughs> I'm single, so that's why um, I did that to myself, I suppose. Um, it's, but but that kind of extra component of how God expresses Himself in people is just like palpable here. Um, it's in the fact that our, our cafe barista um, is a, a Korean woman, and so she made our drinks, but she's also like a hardcore prayer warrior in the Korean way of prayer. You're nodding vehemently because you know what that's like, right? It's the people who show up at 5 a.m. every day for prayer. When she says she's praying for you, it's real. Um, and it also includes our uh, lifelong missionaries who are uh, a beautiful Caucasian couple, but they live most of their life in... Um, Oh gosh, now I'm forgetting it. I'm a terrible person. Um, an African nation. So when they came back, they are they look like everyone else in Oregon, but they're feeling so out of sorts. So even for them in their heart to be able to come to a, an environment like Village and say, oh, so now they're like you know these wonderful um, wise uh, grandparents to our Asian American fellowship. They are not Asian, but there is a cross cultural connection that they can make when it comes to teaching. So. Um, yeah, there's, there's just, uh, it's just everywhere. It's in the fact that, you know, when we have different pastors from our own staff leading different components of services or preaching alone, um, the cultural, uh, lens that they bring just naturally, because it's who they are. Um, it's, it's just no longer like a costume. It's actually the whole person. I'm curious about that. You mentioned something a while back about how Village kind of looked around its neighborhood and realized that the demographics in the neighborhood were changing yes. outside, but not so much inside. Yes. They made an intentional effort yes. to begin reflecting within the composition of mm-hmm. their staff mm-hmm. more demographic diversity. You mentioned also like when people are platformed or you know show up on stage, the value of being able to see someone who looks like Absolutely. you and can speak in that same kind of heart language. Yep. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the importance of intentionally developing a diverse staff yes. and what you've experienced in that level to not only celebrating on a Sunday, you know, this kind of thing, but also figuring out how to work through all of the cultural differences inside of a staff. Oh, yeah. 
and I will start by saying we are still working on that. <laughs> um, talk about communication style differences. So many. You know, you there are certain. Um, I'll just say it this way. In the last 10 years, our staff has been one where every hire has either been a person of color or female. And so that is just a personal point of pride for me to know that that's the staff I'm on, that that's the staff that I get to um, fill out as well. Um, and that was just an intentionally done thing where we were able to, through our own uh, networks, through our own um, social kind of connections, be able to, um, frankly, one, attract those folks, but also then be able to show them this is who you'd be working with, this is sort of the, the ethos and, and mission of where you'd be working, and have that be a, a really attractive thing for, the, for staff, um, which is why we also have our new lead pastor, Ken Weitzma, um, whose whole kind of career has been really focused on the church being one of justice and reconciliation and all of that. So, um, I mean, some of it is just practical, like nuts and bolts that anyone can do. It's us having, you know, gone through Enneagram or, or Strength Finders and really talking about that. But it's also then in real time having um, sensitive leadership. What, like, for example, our staff meetings, we know that with certain staff members, um, they're not going to speak up in the normal popcorn style meeting that we're so commonly used to here in the Western um, work world. It has to be a, 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 an intentional moment now to say, so uh, we'd love to hear from you now. Do you have anything to add? Or I'd love to know what's on your mind right now. And they will always have an answer, but it's because in that cultural background, they're not the ones to interject. They're the ones waiting, actually, if anything, to be called on. Um, it's, it's knowing that, you know, when, let's say, our pastor, um, where Spanish is his original um, language, first language, when he's saying certain things, it's so helpful if you're able to understand maybe what a certain word means tr uh, translated into Spanish. So it doesn't come across like, wait, what are you, oh, I get what you're saying. There's, there's a component to this where it's more than meeting someone 50-50, and I think that's just a practice that's still just going to have to be learned, and, or, or better practiced, actually. Um, but it's something that we're constantly trying to do. Like, we just last year did another, um, it was for the first time the most robust, but it was like an eight-week um, training on race, faith, and the kingdom. We used... Uh, uh, the Arabon Foundation, I believe, um, their their curriculum on it and had a fantastic facilitator just take us through biblically, but also in real life, how does faith, race, all of that come together? How are we um, practicing it? How are we modeling it, et cetera? So um, it's, it's, it's constant training. It's constant, you know, seeking out other people who are doing similar things. It's, it's constantly being told, here's another book you should read. Like... <laughs> I never had a stack that was waiting for me. Now I have a stack that keeps growing, and it's just like the, the Korean in me just sees it with so much shame. And like <laughs> the American in me is like, look at my wealth of books. But the Korean in me is like, when? When will I actually read them all so they're not just this art piece? <laughs> I'm so fascinated by the, the two identities that you hold simultaneously sure. as both Korean and American. It's caused me no mental or emotional health issues in my life ever. <laughs> I am. You've done a, a lifetime's worth of work figuring out how to integrate those two identities and function well in both worlds. And I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> I grew up in an exact opposite environment in a rural town in Alaska where there was essentially no diversity. Mm. I remember being 16, 17 years old, having a conversation with an African-American man and making a note like, that was the first time I've ever spoken to an African-American person. Yes. And so I didn't really have a framework for thinking about cultural diversity or understanding or appreciating it. And now, as, as hopefully I've grown and matured, yeah. seeing that part of my life begin to develop a little bit more. But what recommendations did you have for somebody who hasn't had the privilege of growing up kind of bridging two cultural spaces? Yeah. Who wants to be a good host, who wants to be... Um, who wants to be a welcome and inviting presence, though a member of a dominant culture, trying to invite someone else in. What recommendations do you have for somebody who wants to be effective in an intercultural space? Absolutely. I also just super appreciate the word choice you, you used, like the idea that it's, it's a desire and it's a desire to be effective. None of that is, um, those are not words that are around like, 
I deserve to be a part of it or I'm missing out so they better let me in kind of thing, you know, because unfortunately it, it's not always going to be that way. Um, the first thing that catches me especially is just what you mentioned about like you grew up in rural Alaska, like you didn't have, there really just wasn't physically any uh, much difference in, in population around you. Um, that is something that gets asked a lot and it's kind of, uh, it's just super interesting. We're, we're in... We're in the future now. We're in 2019. Who knew that we'd be coming up upon the year 2020? Like, I was part of the generation that said that we were probably going to, you know, die at the year 2000, right? Like, we were getting ready for that. One can, even if they're in an isolated place, be able to access uh, videos, lectures, books, so many things that would continue to at least educate them. But then at the same time, um, asking that very question is now a very common one. How does one start? How does one become someone that can be both an ally, and uh, someone that can accompany, um, someone that can learn? All of that is now available. Um, universities do such a great job now with offering that kind of information to students when they enter. The faculty themselves often are uh, part of talking and educating about that. Um, I would also say that um, Sometimes it's realizing, I have a coworker uh, who made a really good point how um, her brother pastors at a very uh, kind of isolated church in very rural um, Midwest. And that the one thing he knows is he has a, uh, I think it's a Middle Eastern doctor available to him in their area. I don't know how far of a drive that is, but that he is intentionally going to be that doctor's patient because at least for the very minimum, he has an interaction with someone that's genuine, who comes from a totally different background. And he's not spending the whole time getting you know, a shot or a checkup and being like, tell me more about your childhood. But he's able to just humanize difference. Um, I think that might be something that people don't realize is what they're actually kind of missing or wanting to experience. It's not necessarily that you need a best friend that's Asian or a best friend who's black, but you are you are lacking an actual human connection to someone who is different than you. And what a richness that can bring to both of you. So if you can't um, kind of almost like man manipulate that into being, the one thing that someone can do is at least be versed in, oh, um, reading up on the needs of that community or being aware of, you know, why did this incident really affect this community so much more than, let's say, my community? Um, and it doesn't mean you have to suddenly um, let go of your community identity, your racial identity, your uh, just identity in general. It just means that now your identity gets seen within also the lens of someone else's and you can kind of flex and see like, oh, there's some difference there. Like, I'm still learning about how... Um, you know, there was so much racialization of denominations in like the early, you know, or in the history of the American church, right? Never considered why some of my own biases, let's say, towards different denominations were probably because they were set in place during a time in the United States where there wasn't a lot of um, co-mingling, there wasn't a lot of seeing the value in each other when we're different. And I have, I have been taught, even as an Asian American, some of those same biases when it comes to different faith practices, let's say. And I had never done the studying of where did that actually come from? So it's 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 almost you know the the friendship part the actually being a part of uh, you know being able to witness into like another uh, at a different community's kind of way of life that's like the frosting and cherry on top the cake is you doing your own kind of study and learning and listening and really then churning within yourself oh. What does this validate about who I am? Oh, what does this challenge about who I am? Um, I'm, I'm certain that as you've gotten older and, and experienced life outside of Alaska, you're realizing, oh, the way we always did this one thing when I was a kid uh, wasn't probably the only way. And that changes, right? The way you think about your childhood it's and who you wrong. are. It's just different. My who best knew? my best high school friend is from Alaska, and she told me how much ice cream they ate growing up. You're, you're, again, you're nodding vehemently, and I'm like, I never knew that was a thing oh, in absolutely. Alaska. I yeah. Thought... <laughs> yeah, no, we eat more ice cream than anybody else in the world. <laughs> me, it just boggles my mind that that's a very quote-unquote Alaskan thing. Like, tell me more. Why? How? Because like... <laughs> <laughs> it's dark and cold and miserable all the time. <laughs> and this is how we cope. <laughs> okay, so that sounds like a podcast for another day. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my goodness. So um, what I'm hearing is, is that the first step to all of this is an attitude of the heart in the individual to say, I want to be eager to learn. Or- I'm going to try to humble myself to try to put my either preferences or frankly biases kind of on the shelf yeah, and look at them as something other than who I am to now kind of be able to receive that a different culture, a different language, a different ethnicity has ways of looking at the world, of celebrating life and milestones, of doing all of the cultural markers. And those have great value in and of themselves. Absolutely. Even if I don't even if I don't understand them or they make a lot of sense on the surface based on my perspective. Absolutely. The 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 key to what you just said is someone is now going to potentially for the first time even question, have I ever even challenged that there could be other ways of doing this that are not just valid, but actually seen as like the way to do it in other parts of our world. I think we just don't ever get out of our own. Um, we live in a great country. We have almost anything we need here. So it's like, how? when do you often ever kind of put your brain into another place of like, oh, if I were to step foot right now in Italy, Korea, mm-hmm. Mozambique, I don't know, you would be the totally different other one who is not uh, performing to the way that everyone else is, you know, and and now you are actually offering someone else there, oh, I've never challenged the way we do this, that why aren't they taking off their shoes? (laughs) There's a lot of ways, and I think one of the things that maybe fears a kind of a, a white Westerner. Sure. is all of the things that we don't know that may cause offense or a stumbling block and things like that. Yes. Are there any recommendations you would have? Just, I know you can speak at length, and we've had this conversation about how to be the perfect stranger inside yeah. a Korean context. Um, but just generally speaking, are there some things that can be kind of generalized about how to avoid unnecessary offense in the way that you behave and conduct yourself? Yeah. I. You know... Um... This might be more specific to my Korean upbringing. And please, yeah. Okay. But I do feel like in general, if I were to super, super generalize, I, I don't think we raise our U.S. culture kids um, to really think about, uh, make sure you're reading the room, son, daughter. But that's sort of a more, um, I, I think, slightly more universal trait for other cultures. I was introduced to a classroom game called Noonchi. Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> which is literally reading, literally reading the reading room. Reading the room. Wow, that was done as a game. That was done as a game, and so just for those, I'm sure not many people are aware of this. I so love, please correct me if I I'm love wrong. that this happened. So I was in a classroom in a Korean context, and there was he was actually Anglo, but he had lived in Korea for five or six years and done some education work. He, and so he went right to the nerve. He went right to the nerve, and wow. so Noonchi is a game in which. Every member of the classroom, without speaking, must stand up. Mm. But they cannot stand up at the same time as another person. So you have to read the senses of everybody else. And so, anyway, so what you have is this kind of silent ballet as everyone is looking around. And the way you lose is to be the last person standing. Yes, now you're just being lazy. So you have to take the risk of standing up without communicating. It was a fascinating thing, but that right there is is a fascinating and fun way to indoctrinate the value of Reading the room, yes. paying attention to other yes, people's exactly. Yeah. So, I, thank you for using the the better words. It's literally most cultures outside of the U.S. are very collective, right? We're sort of like the most independent culture. So, when you have a collective culture, you're raised not only within your own family, but all your social inter- interactions really confirm and affirm that you are doing well in society if you're able to read the room, if you're able to be thinking about someone else's needs, if you're able to sort of almost foresee what what someone's going to do or need next kind of thing. Um, in Japanese, I can't remember the actual word in Japanese, but I thought the definition was the most perfect one and it was feeling the air. Yes. So you're, you're looking for those unspoken clues in body language and all of that. Um, f- just again, for your, for your watchers, for your listeners, nunchi in Korean is genuinely a word that means kind of along the lines of like tact, um, reading the room, um, kind of ability to be um, uh, aware, right? And so it's something that's instilled in children all the way up to being like a a really sought after character trait in somebody. Like, oh, she has a lot of nunchi or oh, he has, he had so much nunchi. In that moment, he got up and got this thing and it was perfect, you know? So all that to say, um, 
I've already forgotten our question. Um, oh, ways to make sure you avoid yes. making yourself. <laughs> yes, there it is. The game just threw me out. I still want to do that game now. Um, I, 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 so all of that to say, I think it's natural for us in the U.S. to be taught, hey, square your shoulders when you enter a room, look someone straight in the eye, uh, don't be aggressive necessarily, but don't cower and go for that handshake. Forcefully. Yeah. yeah. Strong handshake. Smile, big, show your teeth, all those things. <laughs> Um, but if you think uh, a good example would be um, in Beauty and the Beast, the animated version, um, when the Beast is getting made over in the mirror, and they're like, "What do you think?" and they've like put him into like all these curls and ribbons, and they're like, "Smile!" and he smiles, and it's all of his like claws and fangs like just showing. It was just too much, right? And he just finally got rid of it and came to Belle as his natural Beast self, whatever. Um, there, there's something to just the natural way that we've raised our, our people to be confident and, and fun that can often come across as almost too much when you're in a non-U.S. setting. So how can you just at least kind of remind yourself, hey, read the room. Oh, everyone seems to be taking their shoes off. I should do that too. Or at the very minimum, how do I change my body um, posture, my body kind of language to show that I'm not trying to square off and, and, and be the first one to initiate, but instead I'm going to let you kind of do that. And yes, that might mean now like an introduction takes a little bit longer. Um, yes, it might feel like you're sort of dancing around something instead of just saying so you want the steak for dinner? You know, like, um, um, but, but that's all seen as, as the, the correct way to not almost be the one that dominates. I think that's the main thing is realizing that potentially as a stranger, you might be doing things that come across as dominating versus even offensive. Um, people are usually pretty good with being like, especially nowadays, like, I get it. This person's brand new to this country or this culture, et cetera. But if you even just started with the posture of just like, I don't know, like say it out loud. Should I take my shoes off? I don't know, how, should I, can I, you know, just like smiling but being like, should I shake your hand or should I bow? I don't know, just say it, why not? Um, usually the person will laugh and do a combo of both for you. <laughs> I do a combo of both all the time. I do a wave and a head nod nowadays. That's sort of the way to mix them too. <laughs> I, I think about the incarnation a little bit in this. Like Jesus did not keep his heavenly identity mm. And so there was an emptying of, emptying of himself to adopt, you know, Jesus with skin on with flesh. Yes, right? yeah. And so if that becomes a model there for someone, say, from my perspective, from the dominant culture, going to a, a different one mm-hmm. where now I am their guest, mm-hmm. then that same kind of attitude of wanting to, um, wanting to do everything that I can to enter that world yeah. well yeah. and reflect that well. And of course, it takes sometimes years of oh, understanding yeah. to try to catch all of the nuances. Absolutely. And Not only all the hours you're going to have to log into YouTube and catching up on all the K-pop stars yes. and music. Yes. Because that's just required. Absolutely. <laughs> it, abs- it absolutely is. <laughs> um, yeah, me, me and BTS. So Honestly, time. like... I have to admit this. I have not kept up at all. I know nothing, and I'm so happy not knowing anything. They all sound the same to me. I'm too old now. (laughs) Well, we'll we'll forgive you for that. Thank you. Okay, as we conclude here, any kind of final words of wisdom that you would want to impart to somebody who would be eagerly wanting to try to make sure that their ministry expression includes a multicultural dynamic? Absolutely. I think it's one that... um, it's never too early or too late to try something. Um, there's a there's a, a neighboring church where one of their staff was asking me that a concern they're having is they want to start doing more translations in service um, like we do, but there's some pushback of well some of the language which, languages we that you're proposing translating slides into let's say um, the people group that would benefit from that language translation there's not a lot of them here yet or there aren't any here really regularly so let's just wait until they're actually showing up. Logical mindset. At uh, same time, um, there's so many other reasons to start doing that now. One, to actually put it out there that you are a community that's for those people as well. I wouldn't have come to Village had my mom not even mentioned to me years back, like, well, you know, they kind of have this multicultural thing going on. She didn't know what that meant either, but she had just heard it. So that even helped me first visit Village as just 
an, a guest for the first time being like, well, it sounds like I should at least check it out. Um, so, so there's that. But also, um, even if, let's say, you don't have, uh, let's say, the people groups that represent some of the, the specifically, let's say, culturally different things you want to do within your community, your own community will benefit from at least having experienced it however you're trying to do it that one time, you know? Maybe um, the translations are up just because your own community is going to practice just singing, um, I don't know, Dios instead of God in the chorus, you know? Um, it's little things like that where just it just helps to start uh, reframing a little bit of the heart and mind to be like, oh yeah, God is bigger than just what we know. Um, I also am so grateful that there are so many brilliant people out there, um, much more hardworking and researched than I. And so you can check out their books, their sermons, so many things. Um, our lead pastor has written uh, The Myth of Equality. He's written The Grand Paradox. Um, pastor Paul Choi, again, I would just highly recommend any of the sermons he's ever <laughs> preached, literally. Um, there's some amazing people out there that have done work specifically between black and white, because that is a major um, conversation and necessary sort of foundational piece when you're talking about cross-cultural things in the United States context. Um, Dominique Gilliard is wonderful. Um, there's just so many things out there right now. And it could be in poetry. It could be in music. It doesn't have to be that you just are reading and just trying to, to absorb it all. Um, you know, but that's, that's out there. And then just the fact that uh, one way to start is um, at least at the very minimum, if you are a male in particular or you are a church leader, to make sure that your staff are steeped in um, women theologians and uh, women who preach just to even understand, wow, there, even in the realms of gender, are details that sometimes we're missing for our, our community's needs if it's, let's say, only a male voice preaching all the time or um, only a male perspective, let's say, that gets shared all the time. Um, what are our mothers thinking? What are our wives thinking? Um, what are our single women needing? Um, what are our sisters? And, and, you know, so there's just that whole end to it, too. And there are so many amazing women out there. Um, we're having... Um, and, uh, Alexia, uh, I always forget to say her last name correctly, Salvatore, I think. Um, she's coming to preach uh, soon, and we're trying to get together um, a group of uh, women of color who are leaders here at Village to learn from her, because this woman has every theological degree, has, is adjuncting at every seminary, um, has an amazing background in preaching as well as teaching, and just has done it already, So, or has been doing leadership in the faith context for so long. We want more of our women to just be exposed to her outside of the women on our own staff even, just how do we keep as a church exposing our people? So maybe that's something you're doing if you're a church, let's say, listening in and saying, I don't know what to do. Well, invite so-and-so to come and be a guest preacher one Sunday and uh, ask them to stay for another event maybe where you and the staff get to, to chat with this person and ask her your questions or um, whatever it might be. But um, it's, I think it, the nice thing to think about it is it's, it's supposed to be a lifelong process. You don't have to try to radically change your church in one day. You have to do what's right for your own community. But um, do I think every community benefits when they expand and learn more of a broader multicultural view of God and, and be, are able to see a greater image of God represented? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. It's okay. Thank you Thank so much you. for taking some time to share your experience, your perspective, your wisdom with us. Very grateful for you. Thank you so much for being the best dean at the best college ever. You're very kind. Appreciate it, Vincent. <laughs>